Um, this time we have a 25 year old builder. Um, he's come to see you in your GP um, because he's been feeling quite tired and depleted. Um, he's not been himself the last few days. He, he's not been able to do what he normally does throughout the day. And he's just really become for a checkup. Um, so before we go to his blood results, um, does anyone want to say in the chat? Oh, I haven't got this chat up. Um, hold on. I've got, got it up. Okay, cool. Oh, sorry. Hold on. Um, right, sorry, yeah. Okay, does anyone want to say in the chat what they think could be going on here? Like, what, what, what would you like to, to consider? Just from the brief amount of detail we've got. Anemia, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Should be top, top your list, anemia. Yeah? But, like, but like well, not just anemia, but what else would you like to probably ask? Uh, well, what questions would you like to ask him before we go um, on to more about? Another differential that people said is depression. And yeah, that should always be something you're thinking about. Good. So a lot, a lot of, um, definitely in my GP placement, I saw a lot of site cases, which obviously you haven't done yet, but should always be in the back of your mind. Could this be something that's going on inside their head, which is an organic. It's very good. Anything else? Anything else people uh, are considering or like to know? Uh, myasthenia gravis, yeah, could be, especially if they're more tired towards the end of the day than the beginning. Hypothyroidism. Well, really, really quickly, what's the other classic? opposite one to my sphenia gravis which i think am i right in saying that it gets better throughout the day or yeah like, well, yeah lambert eaton yeah absolutely yeah very good very and good. then important questions to ask about that some people have mentioned are changes to lifestyle changes in diet good infectious good, like symptoms okay are people um are people worried about this guy uh would, would this be a worrying presentation he's 25 years old just come for a checkup, just being quite tired and depleted. Are people concerned? Obviously, you haven't got all the information yet, but would you like to really look into this guy? A simple yes or no will suffice. <laughs> yeah. It's out of interest. So, James has said seems like a standard GP presentation, so probably not yeah. alarm bells. Yeah, um, I, I completely agree. It's qu pretty standard. Yeah, but uh, um, some people are worried about him. Okay, cool. So, good. So, have that back in your mind. Let's go on to the next slide. So, as promised, here are his partial full blood count. And we have a few things here. We have the hemoglobin, um, the MCH, and the MCV. Um, I know you guys had an anemia lecture from Anoush, or most of you might have seen it. But just quickly, anyone want to just say what they think is going on here from the blood results? Normocytic anemia. Yeah. Nice. And what are the symptoms of anemia? So this guy's coming, he's depleted, he's tired. But like what else could be could you see in someone who has anemia? Because it's actually quite a broad, broad disease in terms of its symptoms. Yes, dizziness, fatigue. Shortness of breath, palpitation, syncope, shortness of breath, pallor. Yeah, all of this. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's quite a lot, isn't it? So hold on, do I get them up? Here you go. Yeah. So like fatigue, dyspnea, syncope, very good palpitation. So it, it kind of helps you drill down on what could be the cause, but it, they can present like our guy just said, just a bit tired, just not themselves, and their blood test result. Um, with the normocytic nature of his anemia, um how would we what other tests could we do to categorize the causes so so we, we got we got a guy he's got normocytic anemia um what could we else could we look into to see what could the cause could be uh a reticular site count and a peripheral blood smear are the ones i've got from the chat okay, good yeah like that so uh, you could also uh, also red cell distribution with very good. Yeah, very, very good. So I stole this from osmosis because it's aesthetic and I quite like it. And it also really, pull, um, if we just focus on the normal anemia section today, as someone said, the reticulate site count is really important. So 
reticular sites, which we're going to go into in, in a bit, kind of tell you how the the body is 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 either reacting or or trying to help with the anemia. So if the reticular site count is increased, that basically means that the bone marrow is sensing that there's less red blood cells around the body, and that could be for two reasons, two main reasons. The what the first one is one that everyone goes into exam detail about is hemolytic anemias, all the causes which we're not going to focus that much on today. Um, blood loss, always remember blood loss, and blood loss doesn't need to be seen. They don't need to be bleeding from the left arm to have blood loss. It can be internal, especially malignancies. So I'm sure people know about the rectal bleeding, but it can be invisible bleeding as well. And then you have things which cause a re reduced reticular site count. So basically, this is where the the factory is unable to make the red blood cells. And reticular site counts, the reticular sites are like the, the precursor to full red blood cells. We'll go into a bit more detail in a minute. So keep those two in mind. Let's go on to the next slide. Okay. So we've sort of talked about this a bit already, so I'll just get this up. So basically, they're immature red blood cells, and they de develop amateur in the blood and the bone marrow. So as we said, a sign of increased red blood cell production would be increased reticular sites um, if there's a high level of MCV, and if they're polychromic, which basically just translates to many color. So reticular sites have a shade of grayish blue. It doesn't come out very well on here, but as you see here, there's some cells here which are a lot a lot less red than others and they're grayish blue and those are more reticular size and they're bigger as well which is why you've got increased mcv they're just bigger all right so yes quite just some data and then oh no this thing didn't come up basically if we're worried about hemolysis we can basically pretty much differentiate it by some blood test results and i'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry it's all come up as one i was going to ask you how to do it but but basically, is, is the hemolysis having inside the vessels or outside the vessels? That's the way I think about it. Otherwise, it gets a bit confusing. So if we think about it, if it's happening inside the vessels, that means that the red blood cells are being broken down and their content are going straight into that bloodstream, going straight away. They're, 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 and, they're, and the result is that you get a number of different readings. So, for example, you have increased levels of free hemoglobin if it's inside the vessels, if it's intra. And then you get something called methamalbuminemia, which I can't pronounce, which is basically a breakdown product of hemoglobin called methheme, I think, um, binds to the albumin and that engraves in the blood cells. You also have a decreased level of plasma haptoglobin. Does anyone know what haptoglobin is or what its function is? More, more to the point. Carries hemoglobin. Binds free hemoglobin and allows it to not be broken down by the liver. Yeah, sounds textbook to me. Yeah, it basically mops up he um, um, hemoglobin, free hemoglobin. So if you've got a decreased level, it's like a buffer. So if that goes down, that means there's more free hemoglobin in the bloodstream. So we go back to it again. The tube, it's, if it's broken down inside the tube, inside the vessel, then you're going to have all the contents, including hemoglobin, inside the blood, which will be mopped up by this buffer. You also have free hemoglobin in the urine or hemoglobin urea, which is a red brown urine. And then you have something called hemosiderin urea, which I, I'm sorry, my pronunciation of words are terrible. But basically what's happening is, is that the hemoglobin parts, the iron parts are inside the kidneys and they damage the cells. And you can see this with Prussian balloon stain. But basically for, for, for really for this level, for us at this level and before preclinical, you just need to recognize these words kind of know what they mean and realize that this is a problem that's happening inside the vessels. And then we could really like make this very complicated and talk about all the things that happen extra. But really, if you just go down to the base of it, extra means it's happening outside the vessels, inside the places where the red blood cells are coming into or, or, or are being broken down themselves. And that's the spleen. So if the spleen gets bigger, that means that there's an extra here. Um, oh, someone else took control. Oh. Who took control? Oh, I'll share it again. Yeah. While we're talking about that, yeah, so the spleen has all of these causes of like extravascular hemolysis. Can you name some causes of extravascular hemolysis while I'm reloading the slides? Um, I, uh, I'll move to the slide and then you can take control. Yeah, that's uh so extracellular g6pd and 
Yeah, do you want to take control? Great. Uh, sure. G6PD, hereditary psychosis. Yeah, absolutely. Her yeah. yeah. Uh, warm hemolytic anemia. Yeah, most hemolytic anemias are actually extravascular. Yeah. What else? So I've just been very unpleasant and I've asked you for what is definitely the longer list. So <laughs> the causes of intravascular hemolysis are shorter and it's the list I would learn. Yeah. Um, I think, I think in, I, I wish I've included my table in this, I, but for I'm my... I'm going to put it in the chat now. Okay, nice. Um, but if you break it down, I'm pretty certain that the extravascular ones, the ones that aren't happening inside the blood vessels and mostly in the spleen, it's basically when there's a red cell defect. Is mm -hmm. that right, Anoush? Yeah. yeah. So things like G6BD, hereditary spherocytosis, um, all the things that happen are a problem. It's the sickle cell, thalassemia. That's why in sickle cell you get spleno, um, you get the spleen gets bigger and it dies. That's why all that stuff is happening inside the spleen where, where the red blood cells are normally broken down. But if there's an, something which is hunting red blood cells and breaking them down themselves, like autoimmune, hemolytic anemias, and all those problems, and also when you have red blood cells being broken down in the blood, those tend to be intravascular, and those are the ones we can go with. It's good, but to really understand what the blood tests are showing is also very important. Does that make sense, everyone? I try to make it a bit simpler because I always found this very confusing. But if we break it down just in these two basic boxes, you can pretty much get your idea what's going on. But yeah, I'm sorry to include the table. I thought we did. Oh, that's a shame. Are you posted one in the chat? chat. Yeah, right. yeah. All right. Um, when you say extravascular, where exactly are they being broken down? Yeah, so in the uh, reticular endothelial system, yeah. and the most important yeah. organ in that system is the spleen, yeah. yeah. So absolutely. So it's the liver as well, that's the liver and the spleen, but it's the spleen where you see the majority, that's where you'll see the first sign of anything mm -hmm. going wrong, splenic hypertrophy, or splenomegaly. I'm not sure why I said hypertrophy, splenomegaly is also a correct way of saying it. Yeah. Okay. And more importantly, there is not any free hemoglobin in that plasma. So that that hemoglobin will not be allowed to just be released into the bloodstream. It stays in there, and that's why it gets bigger. Okay? Nice. Right. So back to our case. We went a bit, a bit of a wayward round, but there's a normal acidic anemia. Uh, they have normal to slightly low levels of reticular sites. And so what should we be thinking of? So just going back to what we said before, if someone's got a normal acidic anemia and they have normal to low levels of reticular sites, what are our top two differentials? Bone marrow disorders, yeah. Good. Aplastic anemia, yeah. Like that. And the other one? Ac uh, blood loss, yeah, acutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So acute blood loss with, would, would show normal low levels of reticocytes because the bone marrow isn't able to respond. So the reticocyte count will be low, but there'll be normal cystic anemia because you're losing blood. Good. Um, and lymphoma? Uh, lymphoma? I'm not sure. Be perfectly honest, I wouldn't think it would affect particular sites. Yeah. Unless there's, unless there's bone marrow failure from lymphoma, but I can't remember. I Sorry. think it's less common. I think it would yeah. be less common. It wouldn't give you that. that yeah. Go on, go uh, does chronic blood loss lead to a macro or microcytic anemia? Um, so it would be it would be more likely to be microcytic because you're also going to have like an iron deficiency component if you've got chronic yeah. blood loss. Yeah. So acute blood loss is what the guys, whoever said that at the start, that's, that's bang on. So acute blood loss, that's the pitch you would tend to see. Low levels of reticular sites or normal levels and a normal cystic anemia will be your other differential. But the one we're going to be focusing on, unsurprisingly, is bone marrow failure. So, so, so what are the signs of bone marrow failure? So we've already told you one on normal cystic anemia, but what else could you look for? in someone who you, or would make you suspect of someone who's got bone marrow failure? Infection, yeah, especially like recurrent infections. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you could see like a neutropenia on blood tests. Uh, increased bleeding, yep. Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah, so like the thing that, Izzy summarized it pretty well, you get like this pancytopenia, you've got low counts of all of the different blood cells. Exactly. So it, it's it's actually quite it's quite a difficult one to pick up um, because they, they it can be quite normal that you uh, get 
your audio is gone. Uh, my, is my, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can't hear you. Um, can you hear me now? Oh, oh it's gone. back for you. Cool. That's fine. Uh, Sorry, is it break my it might be my internet? All right, cool. hopefully, just let just, just let me know who stops working. Basically, I'm, I was just saying before, I'm not sure why I cut out, but it's quite a a um, sinister presentation because it's quite vague stuff. So I think at the start, when I had to be fair, I hadn't given you all the information, but a guy presenting with anemia doesn't seem too sinister. But then you go into more information. They've been hospital twice with chest infections, and they got these weird bruises on their shins. Obviously, I didn't give you that information, but always have in the back of your mind, just because anemia is common, which it is, it can also be part of quite a sinister picture. So something just to bear in mind for that. So um, what actually happens in a bone marrow? And oh, no, it's not going to work, is it? I don't, you can't ask someone to go over the whole thing. But basically, everything happens. So we have hemopoiesis, um, which can be broken down simply into two progenitors. So you have your multipotent, or multipotential stem cell, which breaks down to your lymphoids and your myeloid progenitor. So you understand from, I think we did this in first year. I, I didn't, I don't think I did it in first year, but we learned about it in first year, we meant to. And your lymphoid progenitors are basically your um, white blood cells, so B cells and T cells and natural killer cells. And then your myeloid is everything else. So it's your um, your first line responders, your neutrophils, eosinophils, monocytes, and also your red blood cells, um, your mast cells, your histamine production, and your megakaryocytes, which break down into your platelets or thrombocytes. Okay, so to be honest, it is worth learning this. It genuinely is annoyingly um, because it can kind of point you to what the underlying condition could be in anyone who's got bone marrow failure, which we'll go into. Um, and yeah, it's good to have the back of your mind, especially how to differentiate between what is a myeloid and what is lymphoid. If you just remember that lymphoid is white blood cells and everything else is myeloid you're pretty much going to be okay but um yeah good to bear in mind what's happening inside the bone marrow okay so we do a focus history of the guy which i didn't give you at the start and he has been feeling weak and tired as he said he's been feeling short as a breath when he's been doing activities which he normally could be able to do quite easily and he has had recent hospital emissions for chest infections and frequent nosebleeds so we're looking at a picture of bone marrow failure is looking a lot more likely here. Truly, if you had a, a very high nosebleed recently, I mean, that I suppose that could be signs of acute blood loss, but with the other chest infections and his tired weakness, we we're thinking more of a sinister picture here. Okay. So we do his, um, here is this full hematology lab report. We sent off everything, through, we threw the kitchen sink, and we have this picture. So does anyone want to tell me what they think is going on here? Is it fine? Is it good? Is it bad? What else would you like to do? Yeah, sorry, just one thing. Um, yeah, I know that we said, uh, I know Jake said that like m white cells are lymphoid, but yeah, obviously you have like your neutrophils and your granulocytes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, it was just yeah. as an, I it's meant, just I like, meant, I meant it's like just as a general rule yeah 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 yeah. sorry i think i my, my my point in there was that as a general rule white cells are important and then everything but i do appreciate that you have you have one as well yeah. sorry Again, that was should have, yeah should have listened more in first year um okay sorry yes so back to this um what do we think about this what do you think is going on here is it all right is it okay is it worrying so height, white blood cells, loads of lymphocytes um, with large proportion of blasts. James has said ALL um, and Hussein has said AML. Okay. Based so, on age. Okay. So, so James, James said ALL um, yep. based on age. Okay, good. So good. Very good. All right. So. Um, what else would you guys like to do? Any other further investigations? Because we're obviously worried here a bit about um, malignancy. Blood film, bone marrow biopsy. Cool. So bone marrow biopsy. So I've got that for you. I did it in record time. Um, anyone want to <laughs> tell me what, what, what we can see here? What the arrows are pointing to? Arrow rods. Yep. Yeah, arrow rods. So um, UCL normally love histology. They're mad for it. Um, and don't be surprised if histology pictures do come up. 
Um, I was certainly last year, and there were there are a few, but you can kind of work out what's going on from the question. Um, so I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend learning loads of histology slides, but knowing our rods is is useful. It helps you focus down on what's going on. So this is AML, and I'm going to go into the bit about age is good. We're going to go into that. So AML is associated with adults. It's true. Adults tend to have AML presentation, kids ALL. AML is basically when you get blast cell proliferation from myeloid progenesis, um, and it's a rapid progression. Oh, why is this, does it keep going? What's going on? It's gone again. I'll get it. Don't worry. Continue talking. Oh, so, um, so basically, blast cells from myeloid progenitors, and then you get can have a rapid progression. So these patients can present with this sinister underlying disease of like anemia and increased infections and bruising, and they can really progress quite quickly. So in two months, they, 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 could, they, can, they can die. So you really need to get on top of this. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, thanks Mish. So hold on, I'll take control. Um, so risk factors for this is a mild dysplastic state, which we're not going to go into that much detail today, but that's basically where you get a high level of certain cells in your bone marrow, um, your JAK2, all that stuff. Um, and radiation and Down syndrome are also associated risk factors. So going on a bit... Um, three days later, this patient was admitted, and now they have bleeding from puncture sites and their anus, and they also have multiple bruises and ecchymoses on their shins and arms. What's happened? Is this AML just a bit more severe? Has it progressed too quickly? What do you think could be going on here? DIC, yeah. Could yeah. be due to DIC. Yeah. Could be. Could be. And I think I think that's the main differential, isn't it? I'm not sure what else it could be. It, I mean, it could be very severe complex. Um, yeah. DIC is the most important thing here. So DIC. Um disseminated intravascular coagulation. And it is nasty. It is very nasty. It's triggered by a number of things. Oh yeah, I stole from osmosis again. Um, it's very good. Really, really recommend it. So um Basically, sepsis, malignancy, trauma, or obstetric complications, especially preeclampsia, um, can cause this, this DIC picture. So what happens is, I don't want to go into too much um, pathophysiology, but you get a pro-coagulation state. So basically, that means that there's a stimulus that causes all your coagulation factors to be increased. So your tissue factor um, and all these things that make you clot. But that happens too quickly. So you know, the fibrinolysis, the, the pathway to break down these clots is unable to keep up. So even though you're causing more clots, the actual mechanism of breaking them down is, is, is overcome. So you get increased amount of bleeding as your platelets and, and all your other clotting mechanisms are used up by this formation of clots quickly. And it's very severe and these patients need to be treated quickly. Does anyone know what the management is of DIC, like just a, a vague management of how we would manage this patient? What, what what we would give them hint it's basically like any major bleed yeah yeah sfp yeah uh cryoprecipitate yeah activated protein c yeah so um the one thing that people have said is oh yeah call the hematologist absolutely yeah you would definitely yeah, call yeah, the hematologist. I, I, yeah I, do, do not do not ask me you call 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 the hematologists and they, they yeah. this is a serious serious matter and they need to get dealt with quickly mm. um so one thing um so replacing platelets might not necessarily help acutely mm. um so like it's questionable whether or not you would acutely replace platelets that's the only thing i'll say okay um perfect so yeah exactly right so the main thing here the cry precipitate is to replace the fibrinogen and the FFP is to replace the coagulation factors and you also add, add activated protein C. So this is a vague a management plan. But obviously, you need high levels of intervention here because this patient is in dire need of medical attention. Okay. So, oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, it came up too quickly. Uh, right. If anyone didn't see that, um, the age right, which I'm sure a lot of people are fuming at the screen right now because it, they're a bit too young, but... There is a type of AML which is associated with younger patients and DIC. Does anyone who didn't see it <laughs> will have a guess at what it is? Or, or, or maybe people who didn't see it but already knew, obviously. Yeah. M3 AML, yeah. 
Absolutely. So there are many types. I think there's five types of AML. Don't need to know them. Only need to know one. Is that I love it. It's APML, acute proteolocytic leukemia. All right. So this presents younger than other types of AML. It averages around 25 years old. There we go. Um, they're more so to our rods, but they can also be normal AML. But they they tend to be happen a lot with APML. Um, the presentation is actually normally with DIC, so I changed it up so we do a bit. But they normally present with some form of severe thrombocytopenia or DIC, and there's very good prognosis. Because of this translocation, the 15 to 17 PML to Ra alpha genes, you can treat that with our trans retinoic acid, HRA, and it gives a very good prognosis. So these are the sort of patients that present with APML. Mm. Uh, the one thing I was going to say was uh, your translocations, I would definitely recommend learning them. Like there's like four yeah. and they come up. I bet them. Only the important yeah. ones. Only the important ones. There are loads. The, obviously yeah. the Philadelphia chromosome one, I mean, you need to know that. Yeah. And this one, this one as well. As you know, these two, that one and the Philadelphia chromosome one, then I think you're fine. Yeah. You'll get most of the questions on translocations, right? Yeah. I agree. And yeah, and all you need to know about APML really is this, is that our trans retinoic acid. Just remember that. Mm. And also the fact that this DIC is often at presentation. That's important. Cool. I'm gonna okay. um, so what is this showing? Gingival hyperplasia, yeah, absolutely. Um, and when you think about gingival hyperplasia, there's like three things in fourth year that you want to keep in the back of your mind that can cause this. So what would you say those are? Uh, APML, amlodipine, and scurvy. Yeah. Um, myeloid line cancers, yeah, could be that. Drugs like phenytoin, yeah. So the three that I, go, I, I usually go for are APML specifically is more likely to cause gingival hyperplasia than the other forms of AML. But yeah, any form of AML can do it. Um, drugs like cyclosporin, notoriously, the reason they prefer tacrolimus so much in renal transplant patients is because it doesn't cause that kind of uh, gum hyperplasia. But important things are also things like amlodipine uh, and phenytoin, although it's far less likely with those drugs. Uh, and scurvy. So what, what what is scurvy? You don't need to know a lot about it. Yeah, vitamin C deficiency. Yeah, people aren't eating enough oranges. Cool. Uh, that's all the heme stuff we were going to cover for today. We're actually doing amazingly for time. Um, so I'm going to move on to do some cardio, which I find particularly dull, but it's important. Uh, any questions? Just pop them in the chat. So I know I know that we've been planning this ECG session for a while and it will happen at some point, but for the time being, we're just going to do like really like we're just going to do specific findings. So does anyone want to tell me what the most glaring abnormality in this ECG is? So there's a number of things that have been said. Uh, there is ST segment elevation in V3 to V6, which I would agree for, or agree to. Uh, hyperkalemia, there could be an element of hyperkalemia, but I wouldn't say that these T waves, there are some very normal looking T waves in, uh, for example, AVF and 3, in lead 3. Like, they're not that tall. Only really V2 and V3 have really, really tall um um, T waves. Uh, what else have people said? Reciprocal T waves inversion in three. Um, could be that pretty rogue to have just reciprocals in uh, that lead. Uh, and one person has hit the nail on the head. This is widespread ST elevation. So there's ST elevation in one, two, V2 to V6. Um, there's arguable ST elevation in AVL. So with that many leads, you do definitely want to be thinking about widespread ST elevation. And the thing that confirms that that's the sign you're looking for is the fact that in lead two, 
uh, lead one lead and most of the V leads, there's PR depression. So if you look at the segment between the P wave and the QRS complexes, it goes down before it goes up. So all of these findings point to one specific diagnosis. What would that be? Pericarditis, 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 pericarditis. Absolutely. You know the drill. That's like a classic sign. So here, here, here's a case. For, for, so like, I know that some of you aren't, uh, probably haven't had much teaching on ECGs. So here's a case that you might get alongside the ECG, you might not as well in your exam. So now that you know that the diagnosis, you, you know what the diagnosis is, what one bedside test could you do that that's not meant to say relieve, it's meant to say reveal. I was literally <laughs> falling asleep at the keyboard. Echo is one. Uh, echo is uh, a valid investigation, but is not something you can do at the bedside. Yeah, so you're going to get them to lean forward and you can do two things when they lean forward. If the pain gets better as they lean forward, that is suggestive of pericarditis. And then if you listen to their heart as they lean forward and you can hear this uh, rub that is also pointing towards something that might be like a pericarditis. So that's a really useful thing you could do. Um, Echo would definitely reveal it. It's just not every like junior doctor has the skills to do an echo. Cool. So let's talk a little bit about pericarditis. So you get like this pleuritic chest pain. It's relieved by sitting forwards. We've talked about the two really important ECG signs that you shouldn't get, which are you get this widespread ST segment elevation. So you might mistake it for an MI. Hopefully not after you also get the history and you also get this PR depression. Some consultants say that PR depression is might be associated with the amount of like myocardial invo involvement, but uh, I wouldn't you wouldn't need to know that much detail for your exams, I'd say. And then you do like an echo and you might see a pericardial effusion. So everything you said is absolutely correct. Also, Sorry? James, there's absolutely no chance I would be able to interpret an echo now or last year. They will not ask you to interpret echoes. I, I when I was it. making when I was making these slides, I was like, do I put an echo in? And then I was just I like, mean, <laughs> it's so hard. Like I yeah. literally. Yeah, it's just a nightmare. Um, so if we go into causes of pericarditis, how would you categorize these? I just love lists of causes because it's good fun. Can you have a pericarditis without a pleural effusion? You can have a pericarditis without a pleural effusion, yeah. You can also have you can also have a pericarditis without echo if it's really small you could. It makes it very it's very unlikely though. Mm. Yeah. Uh, infective autoimmune uremia can do it. Yeah, that's a metabolic cause. Uh, so viral causes drugs i can't actually think of any drugs specifically that cause pericarditis there there's probably some i just don't know them so those are the five big categories i've gone with uh so viral infections probably said coxsackie yeah that's the commonest viral cause give me one other infectious cause HIV can definitely cause it as well. I hadn't put it on this list. It's kind of rogue, but yeah, it can. Uh, Chagas disease can cause it as well, but it's super rogue and won't come up in your exams. The important one to know is TB. Uh, we'll talk about TB a bit later because it causes a specific type of pericardite. Mm -hmm. It does It does everything. Yes, TB causes everything. EBV, yeah. any virus can probably do it. It's just which ones are more likely to do it. And the, the ones that are more likely to cause pericarditis are HIV and more importantly, Coxsackie B. Um, okay, autoimmune causes? Dressler. Dressler syndrome, very important, the most common autoimmune cause. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, connective tissue diseases, absolutely, because it causes everything. So those are the important ones. Uh, a vascular cause, someone already mentioned, anything after an MI can cause, you can get a pericarditic, a pericarditic picture. Metabolic things, 
We'll talk about restless syndrome in a minute, don't yeah. we? Yeah. We'll come back to it. Um, hyperthyroidism and, uh, as you said, uremia, and that is definitely also an answer. And then you can get like a paraneoplastic pericarditis with loads of random cancers, but I wouldn't worry too much about that because it doesn't come up in exams. Okay, so after you have an MI, you can get two types of pericarditis. You can get like an early pericarditis that's caused by like transmural infarctions that happen within two days. But if the history is a bit longer, if the, if the MI was like a few weeks ago, you, you worry about this thing called restless syndrome. What this is, is basically when you have your myocardial infarct, you get your myocardium gets exposed to your immune system and you develop these antibodies against the myocardial antigens. And that causes like a pericarditis picture. That's all, that's all it is. The only way they'll ask you about these is they'll tell you how long ago the MI was. They'll give you like this person had like central crush and chest pain a few weeks ago. He now has pain on inspiration. What could the diagnosis be? So to know the difference between these two is important. Does that mean early pericarditis doesn't happen with n Um, I'm not sure, but that would suggest that. I'm not actually sure of the evidence for that, though. Regardless of what kind of MI they should they have, you should, and if they present with pericarditis, you should consider both of these, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, but, like, academically, I don't know the answer. How do you manage restless syndrome? We shall talk about that next. How do you think you would manage Dressler syndrome? Steroids, NSAIDs, steroids. <laughs> oh, classic NSAIDs, answers. Uh, so you don't really use steroids for pericarditis. Um, but the main thing, any form of pericarditis, you treat NSAIDs. the underlying causes and you um, you can use NSAIDs or colchicine if there's like an acute pericarditis episode. So that's how you would manage. I think the current evidence is actually to use a combination of both NSAIDs and colchicine, but um, you don't need to know Nick, that much. Can I, can, I, can I ask just really quickly? Yeah. Um, is the, do you know, don't worry, do you know if the NSAIDs are used to treat the pericarditis or to relieve the pain? There, than... I think the NSAIDs are a combination of anti-inflammatory and anti-analgesic. Oh. And the colchicine is purely anti-inflammatory. Okay. I think. Uh, don't quote me on that. <laughs> uh, with treating the underlying disease cause for dresslers, how do you deal with the antibodies? You don't need to. They self-resolve, actually, with dresslers. You just, you just need to manage the inflammation. So don't worry about that. Uh, the underlying cause thing is more important for things like tuberculosis, for things like uh, connective tissue diseases. Um, like I say they're rare but loads of patients at the free have had like pericarditis due to like lupus um so there's a spot diagnosis for you what does this image show absolutely this is pericardial class calcification so if you look around the borders of the heart you will see they are nice and bright this suggests that there's some kind of calcification around the heart. Um, and the important thing you want to think about in this case is, is this a constricted pericarditis? So if you've got a constricted pericarditis, these are the extra signs you might want to try and elicit on examination. You might want to hear this loud S3, and you might have a raised JVP that rises further on inspiration. What is the name of this sign? Yeah, this is this is Kussmaul's sign. So when you get a paradoxical rise in your JVP on inspiration, that's Kussmaul's sign, and you want to be considering something like constrictive pericarditis. So any pericarditis can cause like constriction of the myocardium and its inability to and causes it to be unable to pump. But like it's very heavily associated with tuberculosis because of this calcification effect. Does um, Chrismal's sign come with Chrismal's breathing DKA? Was it named after the same guy? 
It might have been named after the same guy. I think it's the same guy. Some people just get mad about getting their names after things. Yeah. Um, But yeah, because Christmas breathing is a bit different, you get that really, really heavy breathing decay trying to blow off all the carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. That's a a good sign for decay to remember. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And anyone with constriction pericarditis is likely to quite is quite likely to show features of right heart failure. So what so what are some of the features, important features? Peripheral edema. Basically peripheral edema, raised JVP, might have ascites if it's really, really bad. I'd hope not. Hepatomegaly, yeah, that kind of thing. You, you know the drill. Okay. And when you see a patient with constrictive pericarditis, what is the what is the most important differential that you do not want to forget? Absolutely. Tamponade, yeah. Cardial ta- uh, tamponade is super super important, and there's a few really important things about it. So there's this classical triad. Do you know what it's called? Bex triad, absolutely. And what are the three elements of Bex triad? Muscle muscle parts, parts yeah. Hypotension and a raised JVP. Yeah, that's the that's a really important triad for you to remember. Um, Bex triad, and there are two other important features in cardiac tamponade that are not going to be present in constrictive pericarditis. One of them is, one of them is pulses paradoxus. Do you want to tell us what pulses paradoxus is? We'll come back to electrical alternance in a minute. So, Hussein, what was pulses paradoxus? Or, or yeah. So when the BP drop on inspiration greater, and it's a systolic drop of more than 10 millimeters of mercury yeah. specifically, that, that's a cutoff you do need to know. Um, OK, uh, who, on, who said it? And Prina, what's electrical alternance? Yeah. The height of the QRS complex alternates, absolutely. Um, could you repeat that cutoff? Uh, sorry. So, pulses paradoxus is when you have a drop in systolic blood pressure on inspiration of more than 10 millimeters of mercury. Electrical alternance is when you've got a variable height that alternates when you look at the QRS complexes due to the heart swinging within the fluid. And this is exactly what electrical alternance looks like. Is cardiac tamponade just a serious cause of constrictive pericarditis or do they have different etiologies? Cardiac tamponade is basically like a super, super, super high pressure pericarditis, but it it might not, not necessarily be to due to like infection or inflammation if you bleed into your pericardium you can get like a really bad tamponade as well so like it depends on the cause why is kusmol sign absent isn't the same principle in tamponade so i'm not actually sure about why kusmol sign is absent i I was i was looking this up i didn't really find any i i'm not sure why it, it is exactly uh jake i don't know whether you know or if anyone trying, 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 just trying to think if like because if your Christmas sign is when you get your JPP coming down, so maybe because the pressure's so high inside, which is as in no, Christmas sign is when you've got a paradoxical rise. I think yeah, sorry, rising. I think the I think the pressure is so high that like your breathing makes no difference. I think would be the logical explanation, but I'm not actually sure. That's a really good question. I think I think it's a good point as well, but. With with these patients, you're not going to be looking at their JPP that long. You really need to, if you're considering tamponades, there's some there's some signs that you really are really important uh, to pick up. 
And the Lurch Board, you know, is one that's good. Yeah. Especially the backside. Sorry, that's... It's not absent, is it? I thought it was. I'd, 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 I'd be honest, I'd, I hadn't heard of that. But I don't know. I, I, there's a lot of things I hadn't heard of. Yeah. Let me check really quickly. Tampanard. I nicked these off... Uh, Yeah, it's usually it's rarely present. Yeah, I nicked these off. Um, um, what was his name at the web? The head of cardiology. Oh, you're asking the wrong person. <laughs> Cusmal sign is not seen with. Yeah, God, is electrical alternance? It's going up and down every time and just being it variable. It's actually it usually tends to be every time because it's like swinging in the fluid. If you think, yeah, if you think about it, the heart is there, then the e where the ECG cable leads are sorry, the, the heart is going to carry on swinging like this towards and away from the leads. So you're just going to be able to pick up the GRS complex easier with every other beat or so because it's the position yeah. of the heart. It's also that also having that in mind really can really help you remember the other thing. So the muffled heart sounds is because you've got that fluid around it, so you can't pick up the heart as well. So yeah, mm. that is, is a good remember that big bag of fluid around that heart, and that could yeah. help you fix your memory. Yeah. yeah. Sorry about the Christmas sound, but yeah, you can you can sometimes see it in tamponade, but it's super rare. I think I don't think you normally do. Is what I would remember for exams. Okay. Okay, across pulses, alternance being a powerful but less strong alternating pulse. Is this something else? So pulses alternance doesn't tend, isn't really an indicator of pericarditis. You can get that in things like heart failure, um, where your heart can deliver one strong beat, but then doesn't sufficiently fill the next time, so you get a weak beat after it. Um, pulses alternance is also important, um, but yeah, in a different context. Is that okay, Adam? Uh, here's a case for you to read. No worries. So this is a man who's had difficulty getting out of his chair. He's been feeling weak and he's been in a lot of pain. Just remember those two questions. So what signs are you going to look for and what blood test do you want? So this is what you see when you have a look at his hands. So, these are, are Gottron's papules, absolutely. Um, so if we go back to the questions, yeah. So the other signs you're looking for, one of the signs is a heliotrope rash. What other signs could you look for? Sure yeah, and the other important one is the sure sign, absolutely. Brilliant. So now that you've done that, what, what is the condition that you've all been thinking about, hopefully? You might not all have been thinking about it, but that's okay. Yeah, so this could be a dermatomyositis. And there's a number of different investigations you can do for dermatomyositis. Can you name some of them? This is one of the room diseases with just a million tests. So yeah, you could do creatine kinase to see how the muscles are doing. You can do specific antibody serologies. So you could do anti-JO1, anti me anti We'll talk about these on the next slide. You could do an EMG if you're worried it's a muscle problem. Um, if it was dermatomyositis, you'd, if you were confident it was dermatomyositis, you'd probably skip the EMG. Yeah. And absolutely, you would screen for malignant. Yeah. That's, that, that is classic. That's, that's, that's a classic. That, that's FBA. so important. Yeah, always, always screen for malignancies. Mm -hmm. So these are the other signs you should look out for. The bottom one is the heliotrope rash. We spoke about it, how it kind of looks similar to amyloid eyes or like the uh, sign in basal skull fractures. And this is not a very clear image of the shawl sign, but they get this rash over the back of their neck, which is also quite important. Uh, so dermatomyositis, it's like it tends to be this inflammatory proximal myopathy. If you get it without any of the skin changes, it's just called polymyositis. You can get an isolated dermatomyositis, although it's not super common, or it's often associated with other connective tissue diseases like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. But importantly, I think up to 30% of cases of dermatomyositis in adults 
are associated with an underlying malignancy. And this can be a lymphoma, a breast cancer, a lung cancer. So you should always try and screen for these malignancies if someone presents with dermatomyositis. Um, and you or you got the investigations. Right. Uh, I'll come back to that question in a minute. Um, creatine kinase is the most sensitive test, but it's not very specific to dermatomyositis. Any muscle problem will cause that to go go up. Same with inflammatory markers. But here, here is like the crux of the antibodies for this. anti jo one anti-MI2 and anti-SRP are the antibodies you want to test for in dermatomyositis. And all of these are anti-tRNA synthetase antibodies, but I doubt they'll ask you about that. But you need to know that these are the specific antibodies you're going to test. You also, also do an ANA because any patient gets an ANA if you're worried about autoimmunity. Also, I just want to say really quickly, for anyone who's with all these different antibodies that you see, I want you to learn. They are they are useful to do for SBAs, but if anyone's like worried about them, just make some flashcards and just do it on yeah. the back and turn them over and test. That's that's how we did. I we just I just made the flashcards and learn them again and again because they they will literally give you the diagnosis from the question, even if you don't understand most of the stuff that they're saying. So it's very, yeah. very they are very helpful. Antibodies are some of the easiest questions you'll get in your yeah. paper. This yeah. they're so worth learning. Yeah, it makes very difficult, not very difficult, but like like complex conditions easy to pick out. And it's a really good spot diagnosis as well. They're just like, oh, they have anti Joe one and anti mi 2 for example. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, is it a paraneoplastic syndrome then? Yeah, so someone messaged me the other day about like, what is a paraneoplastic syndrome? And this is like an example of a paraneoplastic syndrome. A paraneoplastic syndrome is basically a set of physiological changes that occurs in your body due to like the cascade of chemicals that may be released by a certain type of tumor. So dermatomyositis is quite an important paraneoplastic syndrome that you should be aware of. Can you think of any other important paraneoplastic syndromes? So yeah, Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, super important. Tends to go along with what cancer? Oh, SIADH is so important as well. Uh, thymoma is not Lambert-Eaton, actually. So uh, Lambert-Eaton tends to go along with small cell lung cancer. Yeah. What you're thinking about with a thymoma is myasthenia gravis, which can also occur on its own without a thymoma. Um, and then, yeah, you can get loads of these other syndromes. You can get hyperparathyroidisms. Yeah. So like the term paraneoplastic syndrome doesn't refer to a specific like thing. It's more just a set of physiological or pathophysiological changes that occur due to molecules released by a cancer. The, l the, l the lung cancers like, ones. There's, there's a couple of the lung cancers, aren't there, as well? There's an yeah. ACTH one as well. Yeah. No, the lung cancer ones especially. They're super important. Okay, and what we're going to go on to next is basically like proximal muscle weakness is one of the, like a really important differential diagnosis, not in terms of SBAs, but like just uh, you're missing a term of clinical medicine, but in clinical medicine, it's a super important presenting complaint. So how would you categorize like causes of proximal muscle weakness? Yeah, so you could have a neurological problem. Yeah, absolutely. You could have an iatrogenic problem, endocrine or metabolic problems. Yeah. Infections, trauma. Yeah, you know, it's your standard categories. But there is one extra category that I'm going to add to this one, and it's causes of a false weakness. So certain conditions you'll get, you'll get like pain, which causes people to say that they feel weak, but there's not actually any true weakness. They just don't want to use their muscles because they're in pain. And there's a few conditions that can cause that as well. So now if we go through these, uh, give me a neurological cause of a proximal muscle uh, weakness. There's a few. I've only put one on the slide because there's one important one. Yeah, guillain -Barre is the important one. Yeah, Nice. Um, so stroke can preferentially affect distal to proximal sometimes so like it kind of depends but with stroke remember that you'll have like a hemiparesis problem is a proximal myopathy the same as proximal muscle weakness 
Um, I don't know why this slide isn't showing the title, but I put um, I put proximal muscle weakness in quotation marks because they're not quite the same thing. Because neurological causes of proximal muscle weakness wouldn't be a myopathy because there's no problem within the muscle itself. Is motor neuron disease one? Motor, motor neuron disease can, in fact, present with proximal muscle weakness, so it could be. Um, for your exams, it's not like a barn door obvious example. So, uh, infection, infective causes. There's like one important one, yeah, Lyme disease. So you could put it under neurological as well. Uh, we spoke about inflammatory myositis. Metabolic causes are quite important, and there's three important ones that you need to know about. Uh, Cushing's is one of them, but I'm going to put that under steroids. PMR is not, unfortunately, not one of them. Hypocalcemia can cause it, but uh, I'll accept hypocalcemia. It's not on the slides, but I'll, yeah. Diabetes, absolutely. What's it called in diabetes? There's a specific name for it. So what is diabetic proximal muscle weakness called? Yeah, diabetic amyotrophy is the, the really important thing. Hypothyroidism. Yeah. So the really important ones for you to know are hypo and hyperthyroidism. Both of them cause proximal muscle weakness and diabetic amyotrophy. So B12 is less. What does B12 tend to cause? What's like the most important B12 problem? More than this. Subacute degeneration of the spinal cord is like the more important thing than when you than worrying about this. Absolutely. Uh, drugs, any cause of rhabdo, but rhabdo can also be generalized. So that's not a great example. But yes, yeah, steroids and Cushing's are very important causes of proximal muscle wasting. So any any patient you see on long term steroids is likely to have really hip, weak like hip extensors, knee extensors. So don't forget about that. And then you have these causes of false weakness. So what kinds of things would cause like someone to not move because they're in so much pain, but they actually have no weakness when actually moving? Polymyalgia. Yep. Someone said that already. But yep, absolutely. PMR. Fibromyalgia. Yep, definitely. What else? I've given you one. Because <laughs> I thought fibro was the next one, but I was wrong. Yeah, it could be traumatic. Yeah, absolutely. Didn't put it on the list, but yeah, it could be traumatic. One, the most important, the, it's the commonest cause on this list. It's more common than osteoarthritis and it's more common than fibromyalgia. Yeah, depression can cause, yeah. Um, you don't need to remember every single one of these. Like this is more like, I just, this, I'll get, on to, I'll get back to it in a minute. There is a learning point for this. Now that you know this, what investigations could you do? Now that you know that the differential is so wide, What, what, what other, yeah, this is a bit of a thought experiment. Yeah, you definitely do an EMG. Like, if you had no history, you would do an EMG. You would do nerve conduction studies. Uh, you do, you've done creatine kinase, but yeah, sure, we can do it again. You do glucose, it could be, it could be diabetes. So you could do all of these things. You could do a muscle biopsy, you could do x-rays of the joints you could do a mental state exam you could do literally anything like go to town it, it, you could go to town you could do tfts but like there is like an important learning point it's like one of the widest differentials in medicine if you don't take a thorough history and you don't consider everything you're going to spend a ton of money and a ton of time investigating these patients so spend time taking the history spend time thinking through what it could be because otherwise like it is quite time consuming and you could miss something Right, that that's just the learning point. You don't need to also, remember the also anno annoyingly, what's common is common. So what common that, yeah. Yeah. So things that are more likely to come up than others have on your mind. But yeah, very, very wide differential list. Yeah, absolutely. So some so last time some people asked for some SBA, so we're gonna try this out. So if you go to vvox.app and then you type in wait, don't type that code in yet. I need to sign in. We're going to try doing some SBAs. It's not going to work if you type in. Give me a second. 
also this is kind of a trial because uh, as you probably know medsoc will be doing like uh sba sessions for you and this is the the platform we're going to try and use yeah let us know if you find these useful yeah because we can put a few in at the end of each session like that's... obviously there's huge numbers of banks you can use but if you want like specific sbas to stuff we've covered then this could be yeah. useful. so you should be able to go to join that meeting now so there's the code again let me know if it works preferably <laughs> or don't i think i'm on i think it's worked lovely so let's do the first question so the first question is open have a think about it answer it and then we'll go through it in a minute Oh, wait, let me show you. You need to see the ECG. <laughs> it's very good, this. Is this like the opposite to Menti meter? It's like Menti, but it's free at the oh, moment yeah. because of lockdown, which is nice. Oh, very nice. I'll give you a couple of minutes. OK, cool. I'm going to close it there. Oh, wait, there's still 10 people who haven't voted. So I, I, I think this is a slightly unfair SBA because I think in your exams will be a bit more barn door obvious. So let's, I'm going to close it there. So, so every, uh, I'm not going to show you the responses because I need to show my screen. But anyway, so 45% of you went for colchicine, 25% of you went for peri pericardiosynthesis. So the answer in this case was actually pericardiosynthesis. Um, you're worried that it could be tamponade or like constrictor pericarditis due to the elevated JVP, which is a sign of right heart failure. And so you want to try and sort out his, you want to prevent him from going into um, his heart failure from worsening. So you'd want to remove the fluid from his pericardium. I think in an exam, they'd probably tell you that he also yeah. had muffled heart sounds or something. So yeah, but yeah. They would, also, they would is, also probably, yeah, yeah. They would also probably make it more more clear that he has right heart failure as well, possibly. But, but yeah. it's, good, it's good to have it in the back of your mind also for this be a like, heart failure. Sorry, heart where's failure. the link for the MCQs? So like if you go to this, if you go to this website and type this in, you should be able to get it. Ah, oh, there, you, James, great. Thanks, James. Yeah, so yeah, they they give you more information in a in in a UCL SBA, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. But yeah, I I take it those of you that gave culture scene went with colchicine because of his history of chronic kidney disease, which is smart. That's good. You're thinking about the fact that NSAIDs can deteriorate renal function. So really good knowledge there. But yeah, sorry. But yeah, you'd probably go with pericardiosynthesis. Uh, let's do another question. So we're polling is open now. Ooh. So to be fair, th this question wasn't in 
uh, on the slides. So that, that's <laughs> me. <laughs> but a lot of you seem to know it. So. We're on 50 out of 70 people, so I shall wait until it gets to 60 and then I'll close it. So, as usual, like advice for SBAs, try and rule out what you know is definitely wrong, and then between what you have left, you, you can guess if you really don't have a clue. So, try and do that for your SBAs. The most popular options in this were 30% of you went for muscle weakness leading to hyperventilation. 40% of you went for pulmonary fibrosis and 15% went for serositis. Um, so serositis could happen if it was part of like um, lupus or there was like an underlying lung cancer, but isn't like, it's not super common with dermatomyositis. Um, muscle weakness leading to hyperventilation again could happen, but the muscles in, affected in dermatomyositis tend to be a proximal limb muscles less so your respiratory muscles like it could happen but it, it, it's quite unlikely the answer is pulmonary fibrosis so mm -hmm. if we go back to the relevant slide for a second also, oh, also guys guess. just it just in, something that sometimes works for me but doesn't always work is, is the cover test um I'm, someone might have mentioned it to you before but if you just cover over and look at the question and don't look at the answers and then try and think oh what could be the complication and yeah. you probably, pulmonary fibrosis may spring to your mind because you remember it's associated with dermatomyositis, but because it, 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 when you see the other ones there, you may make your mind more clear mm -hmm. which one it is, because they're both possible, but as and you said, yeah. one's more than the other. Yeah. Um, like the reason we, I was actually avoiding going in SBAs for these sessions yeah. until now is because I think that like, if you can give me an answer without ha being prompted by SBAs, that means exactly. you're 100% gonna get it right in the SBA and not get thrown off by the other answers. Um, is it upper lobe fibrosis or lower lobe fibrosis? Does someone in fourth year want to answer that question? <laughs> yeah, don't ask me. <laughs> As in, I know the answer. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's it tends to be lower lobe fibrosis. Um, well, so actually most, most connective tissue diseases cause lower lobe fibrosis. The only one that really causes upper lobe fibrosis are <laughs> ankylosing spondylitis and sarcoidosis. They can all cause either, but they tend to prefer the lower lobes. Is that okay? Wasn't there an acronym for that? Like, uh, oh God, breasts. sorry. <laughs> yeah, I can't, I can't remember that. It's like breast. It's for uh, upper lobe fibrosis and then everything else is lower drawers? lobe fibrosis. Is it drawers or something? But anyway, no. Yeah, there's a few. I learned one of them. Yeah, useful. That's death. Uh, Scart Brassy. There is definitely a better acronym than that. Yeah, that whatever works for you. I feel like the best the best one seems to be quite yeah charts. I remember, I remember seeing charts. It, it, charts. it is helpful okay. to know. Yeah, but um, don't okay. kill yourself then yet. Yeah. So yeah, um, what I was gonna say was if we I, uh, so if you have anti Joe one antibodies, you can get this thing called anti synthetase syndrome, which is a combination of dermatomyositis and lower lobe fibrosis. It's quite common in patients with dermatomyositis. So yeah, know about that. It's one of the reasons, they, it's, it's the reason they'll probably die in the future, actually, it's really sad. Um, two more SBAs and then we're done. Um, so which of these is, would be the most likely coagulation results for DIC? Admittedly, again, we didn't actually go through this, <laughs> but if using, yeah, just try go go for it. See, see how guys do. Do you, want to, do you want to know something super embarrassing? I answered it and I, I, put, I wrote the question, but I picked the wrong answer <laughs> just now. 
Oh, yeah, have the best of us. It's a late. Okay, so I will stop it there. So you were pretty 50 50 between the last two options. Uh, Jake, did you pick the third option? Um, I can't remember. Yes, I can't remember. <laughs> so the correct answer yeah, exactly. was the bottom one. So you could. Bleeding time is like this archaic test that we don't use anymore. Bleeding time is where they literally make a cut, and it's like, how long is the is it going to take for you to stop bleeding? It's 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 a terrible test. Um, in DIC, you have the consumption of all of these clotting factors, so your bleeding time is tends to be normal to 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 prolonged. So that's why the answer is the last one, not the third one. Any questions yeah. about that? It's a nasty is, question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is a nasty question. Is we're not gonna as in like this is the thing though. Like I hope we're not scaring anyone. But the thing is, you have access on all of these question banks to loads and loads of barn door questions. Mm. The, the questions we're putting in are just some like slightly higher end questions because you won't get those anywhere else. The more the more important point I think with that. Because to be honest, I imagine if we got that question, haven't done before, and that question for the exam, it would be a similar split. The more important thing to get is you got to that choice of two. Get it yeah. down to the choice of two, and then going, right, 50-50. You're going to hopefully get it right, or at least 50% of the time. But getting it down to those finals is important, so that's good. So everyone realised that the plate, or majority people realised that the potato cap was going to be low, and therefore and there's the, everything's prolonged. And then the last two, a mean question, but, um, but yeah, I, I fell for it as well. I wrote it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and like that's the thing in the exam there are going to be some questions like that where you you can narrow it down to two and you really can't remember yeah. yeah so like it's good that you can get to that stage is the fibrosis because of disease or due to drug treatment for dermatomyositis so if you have anti j one antibodies those can directly damage the lung and cause fibrosis you can also get it due to drug treatment if you take something like methotrexate to immunomodulate the disease so it can be due to either I've seen both. Uh, last question. Here we go. It's open. Oh, someone went in with a confident. Oh, and now they've changed it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what? Can you see what people are doing live? Yeah, I can. It's great. I'm the worst. This is like game. Uh, this is game three. Is, P, is PR depression in tamponade as well as pericarditis? So unlikely because by the time you get to tamponade, you might not get a good enough signal through to the heart to notice PR depression. But if the underlying, if, if the tamponade is due to a pericarditis, then you could get PR depression. They will make it. Ex they make it so clear that this is Bex triad. With with tamponade, so if it, it's it's one of the things to always think about, but they will make it quite clear from the question yeah. what's going on. Yeah, I, sh I I don't know why I didn't put blood pressure on there. It would have made it barn door obvious. Uh, cool. Everyone's answered pretty much except for five people. You took too long. Sorry. <laughs> uh, as in, it's just like I know that like some people need to go and have other teaching and stuff. So um. So the majority of you got the correct answer in this case. The biggest risk factor out of these is myelofibrosis. Um, so yeah. what's like a summary of myelofibrosis? Oh, you're testing me. Ba basically, it, where, I, where I remembered it is that you, someone's going to correct me here, but you're, what was happening is you're getting like fibrosis of the bone marrow itself. And it's one of those minor dysplastics where you get an overgrowth of, is it like fibroblast? I can't remember, sorry. But you get an overgrowth of something and that causes um, fibrosis of the bone marrow. So you get low levels of bone marrow failure, I think. But basically, yeah. so sorry guys, I haven't been over that personally. But the most important thing to know from this is that a myelodysplastic state, so anything that's causing a high level, such as in your high levels of red blood cells, high levels of uh, platelets. Anything that's causing that high level predisposes you to converting, converting the important point here, to AML. So they, they start off, it's, like, it's, it's seen as like the sort of a precursor state, and then they convert. So that's the important thing. So my, my knowledge of myelofibrosis is, is 
Myelin fibrosis is basically just scarring of the. Yeah, um, that's why. I, to be honest, I think the reason I don't know that well, because all I remember is that is it's called fibrosis and it scars the bone marrow and it's yeah. a myelodysplastic state. You don't need so, to know that much about it. You no, do need to know it's a myelodysplastic syndrome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, it seems um, like most people did, so that's very good. Yeah. Um, uh, so, some other answers. Very young. So, just a reminder that. Here's a mistake that people seem to make. The the age ranges for leukemias are not absolute. Like, no. just because someone isn't in the typical age range doesn't mean you don't think about it. Like, you're going to miss diagnoses if you do that. So, yeah, you yeah never sure, take it, into an, take it into account, but that shouldn't be, like, your defining, defining characteristic of whether or not the diagnosis has been made. Um, In one of our heme revision, was it? the end of module heme lecture last year one of the hematology consultants put in a question where someone wasn't in the age range they were just outside the age range and everyone got the question wrong because they just assumed that it wouldn't be that cancer and he's like you can't especially, rule it out first. yeah especially also with the thing we've done today with apml even though that aml is technically associated with adults you can still get young adults spend the young kids really who can present with aml or present or have aml because they have apml so yeah, always don't the, the ages is like just like have a vague idea, but I it'd be very harsh of them to have that as a question. Very young, I think. We just I just wanted to we put it in there to like make you think and go through it. But yeah. But yeah, as in yeah, most of you got it. Yeah, bang on. If you didn't, don't worry about it. Obviously, smoking is a risk factor for lots of different things, but not really so much for AML. Yeah, I did. I, I did. Uh, I was smoking. I was like, oh, it's going to be a big risk factor, isn't it? <laughs> it's like, oh. Not really, yeah. yeah. Not really. Uh, I put a feedback for him. So, like, specific, uh, we, we'd be quite interested to hear what you think about SBAs. Like, it, it is actually quite hard to write good SBAs, as you probably noticed. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 actually, it turns out to be very difficult. Um, but, yeah, if, if, people found it, if people found it useful and like it as a sort of way of summarizing the content in a way that's challenging, then that's good. But, yeah. Let us know. Yeah, just let us know what you think. Yeah. And we can put more in. And as usual, if there's like other specific stuff you want to cover, like everything from today's session, I picked from like your previous feedback. So there's no there's not really much structure in terms of what we're gonna do next. We just do whatever you ask us to. Um, I'm going to stop the recording there. If anyone has any questions, yeah, we, we stick around for like maybe five minutes and we can answer them.